something that struck you from the way you were? What kinds of conversations are you having? Uh, and a few, just two minutes each. I had a very, a very wonderful group, very vibrant. And, and what struck me was that in the group, there were elderly people, not, I mean like people who are in the higher age than, than I am. And we felt very comfortable to talk about sex and how wonderful sex is. <laughs> yes, because um, they pointed out that um, Christianity has taught us to suppress our sexuality, yet our sexuality is connected to our spirituality. And then we had a very wonderful discussion of how heterosexual people want to believe that all heterosexual people do a missionary style during <coughs> sex. Sure. Can we see me? Am I lying? <laughs> Take a survey. Uh, thank you, thank you for sharing. Can we see members of the group? Yes, <laughs> let's survey. <laughs> we are good people. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Motsao. Can you share with us? Um, okay, so um, some of the issues we spoke about around a shared language. Um, the church as, as an institution which is protecting its finances. So some ministers are afraid to speak up because the moment you ruffle a couple of feathers, the tides start going down. So addressing such issues publicly is a problem which may affect, um, and it's a serious concern, um, jobs are on the line. And uh, we spoke about how we need to start becoming creative in the way we express such concepts because many of them are not uh, so clear-cut in our indigenous languages, uh, taking into consideration being sensitive, um, but also at the same time understanding what people know already, not trying to superimpose Eurocentric concepts in contexts which completely have no understanding. For example, the, weird, the word queer, um, was problematized in our group and wondering how can we speak of such a thing but also highlighting um, the unique understandings within the various contexts. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Can you also share with us the deliberations from your group? Uh, uh, yes, uh, some of the deliberations that came up here. Uh, language should be left realities, expressions as to where one is coming from. And then we also... Uh, as a group, you also realize that uh, developing a language is a process. It's a process that must really be thought of and because there is somehow a vacuum and therefore it must really be thought of as what ex exactly do you want to talk about when you're talking about a language that needs to comprise of each and every one of us. <laughs> because you're talking about sex, your phone doesn't understand. Yo! Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Alice. Thank you. Alice will share with us uh, after that interlude uh, on the sharings from your group. Thank you. Um, first of all, we spent a lot of time having vigorous engagement. It was a wonderful group. It might have been better than your group. Um, <laughs> and we asked ourselves what the purpose of language was, whether it is for internal engagement, greater engagement, or focusing on theological engagement. We recognize that language comprises not only the written or spoken word, but also other forms such as drama, like we saw earlier, photography, different forms of language. We recognized also that there's need for the LGBTI community to try and revisit and not to be too sensitive about questions asked by those who are not in the community where communication is not clear. And we pointed to queer being 
raised as a, as a, as a word and a concept and questions being asked, um, but recognizing if the point is to communicate, one should be looking at that mm. and become less defensive. And another key point was really recognizing that ultimately conceptual frameworks mm. form the basis of expression of language. A question was asked about what marks that tipping point between tolerance and acceptance. And it was a shift in terms of the conceptual frameworks as understood by the other. Um, and often it's, it's through fear, it's through um, an inability to relate, but ultimately conceptual frameworks really need to be very clear um, to enable language to be clear and to enable the context within which language is being used to be taken into account. In my group, we did away with the word tolerance. So have we. So have we. <laughs> uh, thank you for the internal conversation. Uh, <laughs> uh, friends, at this moment in time, um, we can interact with our panelists from the floor. Uh, any two or three quick questions? Thank you, Jakub Urbaniak, a still Catholic theologian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe in relation to the paper and, and the framework that was suggested, um, a church theology and people's theology. Gerald, you, you, you told us that we cannot move beyond homophobia by starting with the center because the center is the site of violence. Um, the language of the center and the language of, of people's theology, of the margins, is different. Those are different languages. And um, maybe over simplifying, but the center often uses the language of prescriptions, moralizing, and so on. And we, we saw some examples of uh, the language of the margins as the language of embodiment that doesn't often even need words. My question is how those two can communicate with each other. How, because I, un I understand we don't want to dismiss church theology. We want to transform it. But how ch church theology can engage with the language of people's theology without being patronizing. On the other hand, how the language of, of, of people's theology uh, can be translated, does it, does it have to be translated if it's already a real theology? But we know for it to be taken seriously in different contexts than the context in which it is uh, originally articulated, it seems that it has to be somehow transferred, translated. Um, and maybe just a, a, a last quick comment uh, about the center. Um, within my own tradition, the Catholic Church, I guess it would be fair to say that we deal with polycentric structure, yes. and usually centers indeed uh, uh, bring more disappointment than, than hope. But right now, with Pope Francis being there, in the very center, I would say that sometimes there are good things coming from the center as well. Mm. Thank you for the comment and observation. Uh, anyone moved by the spirit to, uh, I think, to I respond I... immediately? Uh, Gerald? Um, Jakob, thank you. That, that was a very um, important question. A, a lot of work was done within the South African context around that. And for anyone who's interested, there's a brilliant book by Jim Cochran called Circles of Dignity, which is how these circles of people's theology, prophetic theology, church theology intersect. Um, in 1995, I think Jim, Jim wrote that. Um, but, but the argument that was made around the struggle against apartheid was that people's theology, with the added capacity of socially engaged scholars, biblical scholars and theologians, enabled people's theology, which is embodied and incipient and, and incohate, to become a more uh, articulated uh, um, theology. And in that movement from the, the body, if you like, to something more 
um, articulated, it becomes prophetic theology. So the Kairos document itself was a product of people's theology, but was <coughs> prophetic theology. And the idea is that it's what prophetic theology is what then engages church theology in the public realm. Because it's accepted that church theology is, um, in, in its public manifestations, has to be uh, uh, transformed by prophetic theology. So that was the sort of <coughs> the logic, if you like, of people's theology to prophetic theology to engaging church theology in the public realm and a transformation of church theology so that it now embodies, incorporates is the word we use, incorporates the marginalized people's theologies of marginalized sectors. Uh, thank you very much, Gerald. Uh, perhaps at this point in time, I need to go back to my panelists and say, um, in two, three sentences, can you share with us how we can be more effective at our messaging? OK. You know, it's very sad because you prepare a lot and then you are told to say two. Um, and in my group, we also spoke about the fact that we cannot separate language from issues of power and privilege. And the people who use the, the, the language that we are not comfortable with are those who are in power. Um, for instance, um, uh, when the Khabibu went to court, the term that was used on the media, on the newspapers was, gays taking the government to court. And the issue around the term corrective rape was also um, uh, discussed as a very problematic term uh, for us as, as queer people. And then that takes me back to the, to the term queer, that uh, some of the terms, we feel that we can use those terms to our advantage and, and adopt them but we cannot adopt issues around corrective rape because we don't know what we are being corrected of. Uh, but also, um, it is also important to then look at how do we begin to dismantle these, 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 these um, systems of power that, makes, that uses this language that continue to oppress um, LGBTI people. Uh, thank you, Virginia. My apologies for the time constraints. Um, so. Yes, um, I, I, I would, we had one, one very key point, which was um, differentiating between, you know, this conversation we have where the church starts saying, no, uh, when you start talking human rights, you're not talking the Bible. And um, uh, Prof. Piri gave us a very uh, innovative one where the strategy is to proclaim that justice for every human being, you know. So let's not let's not try to debate hum, uh, this right, uh, separate as if they are not human beings or they are higher, but saying everyone is a human being and yes. everyone is created in the image of God. Thank you. Clifford? Yeah, uh, we noted that uh, fear is uh, the common denominator and uh, the unrealistic fear which leads to bruises, death, exclusion, and uh, ignorance, and therefore we all need, what we need is to tackle it holistically. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, dignity was seen as the cornerstone um, of language in terms of trying to find a way how to theologize um, dignity while focusing on interlinkages. Um, between different aspects of people's lives. And a specific example was given of the intersectionality, um, where a colleague shared that when with her partner, a comment was made that the partner was a domestic worker immediately. So the issue of race, the issue of class, um, and the recognition um, that intersectionality is a factor, a major factor. Another way of moving forward would be to recognize that, to move away from the focus on sex, sorry about our colleague at the other end, um, but really trying to focus on the fact that if you're dealing with issues relating to refugees, you're dealing with issues relating to unemployment, you're dealing with issues relating to other aspects, socioeconomic um, aspects in, in people's lives, 
one should be able to see that you could have somebody from the community who is also a refugee. So you're not only focusing on the sex part, but you're dealing with the entire human being. Human dealing being, with yes. human beings, um, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, there was also recognition that human rights, while well, having been referred to earlier on more than one occasion as having been a Western, being perceived as being a Western construct, um, we are aware that on the continent there have been um, struggles to focus on the fact that if you take the Southern, Southern Af South African context, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, dignity as a basis of, of, of human rights, you also see it manifested in the African Charter, which looks at both individual and human rights, so human and people's rights, but constantly calling us to remember the context, our contextual reality, and that there, there can be linkages drawn between human rights, theology, um, as well as LGBTI um, struggles. Amen. Uh, thank you very much. Can I ask the house to please put our hands together for our panel? Oh, thank you. But I yes. am forever the last one. Uh, at this point, is that me? What happened? At this point in time, I will invite uh, Neville to come and share with us on the way forward. So that brings us to the end of the sessions for today in this place. But we have a very big and important event um, this evening at uh, the university, at the main campus. Uh, it's the inaugural Yudi Similani Lecture that is being hosted by the Ujamaa Center and the university.